Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Ken Rosenthal, and I'm a park naturalist here at Gulf Branch Nature Center, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and get started. So make sure everybody is muted. All right, perfect. And then we're going to I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We're going to talk about things that aren't birds that migrate, but we're actually going to chat about chat about birds briefly as well. Oh, I need to share my screen for you. So you can see what I'm doing. Almost forgot that part. Screen, there we go. So hopefully everybody is seeing. I am throwing here. Um, so we are going to talk about uh, non avian migration. We're talking about migration in critters other than birds, although we are going to revisit birds briefly. Uh, if you joined me last month, um, uh, Slight apology, but I want to I do want to review birds a little bit too and make sure that, um, you know, we talk about what moves, why birds move it and what triggers them, because there is similarities and differences. And it's uh, I think as the migration and most people understand and um, it's it's still a good uh, base point to start with. Uh, these are wildebeest which move. Um, uh, in Africa, I didn't want to talk about it too, too much. I just it's always been one of my as a kid, one of my favorite migrations. I always thought that was fascinating and I always thought if I was a wildebeest, I'd be absolutely terrified to do that water crossing right there, knowing what may or may not be in those rivers. Um, but this is, uh, I think, one of the really big and um, really um, amazing migrations that people think about, but they're uh, migrations that happen across many different species, big and small, and some of them are just as fascinating, even though they're not this big or this obvious to us. Um, migration is the movement of animals from one area to another. And what I'm going to add in is uh, a lot of the times what you read is that when people talk about migrate migratory animals, they're really talking about critters that are moving as a result of the season. So there it's a seasonal movement. It's a regular movement. It's predictable. You know it's going to happen as a result of some kind of um seasonal change or other. And it's not something that is either eruptive, which happens every few years, but not every year, um, and it's not uh, accidental or um, unexpected. So, you know, occasionally we have, um, you might find a bird species from some other part of the continent here, yeah. that's an accident. Um, occasionally we get snowy owls <clears throat> here because the, the food crop was, uh, the food crop, uh, the food population of their food was really good up north, and so there are more birds that need to spread out even further. Uh, some years, um, that's an eruption. That's not uh, a regular migration. So we're going to focus on that. And, and again, I'll talk about that a little bit in the end there, um, a little bit more as we get into migration. Um, but again, the classic migratory species for us is birds. Everybody thinks of birds when you think of migration. Two of every five bird species are migratory. In uh, North and South America, the, the migra migration um, pattern that we think of is the seasonal migration where the birds head north in the spring and they head south in the fall. Um, this is a, a map. Each of these dots represents a bird species, not a single bird. Uh, and so that that point that you're seeing or that circle is kind of the median point of all the spe all the individuals of that species. And so when it's blue, that's January, and then it'll cycle all the way through to red, which is December, but showing where that bird species is on an average at different times throughout the year. And you see some go pretty far and some don't. Some go all the way from way down in the bottom of South America all the way to the, the, the northern most points in North America. And they go back. This is a regular migration. Um, this is a, a seasonal migration. This is, can be predicted um, very well by photo period, not necessarily by... Um, the weather they they really react strongly to the lengthening and shortening of the days um why do they migrate availability of food if you're a bug eater you're not going to hang around the winter it's no good uh there's a few that make it okay that uh exploit those kind of food sources in different ways but generally that's the food source that's not going to be here in the winter uh and so you want to make sure you're uh, out of here before that food source ends so you can be somewhere else to eat. Um, but they do come back because the longer days and the available food supplies are really good and there's a lot less predation here than in the tropics. Um, you know, a good classic example for of a bird in our area would be the Baltimore Oriole, uh, the north-south migration. In a book, what you're going to see is a range map a lot like the one on the right. Uh, the red range uh, indicates the breeding habitat. We would also, up here we would call that the, also the summer range because 
that's indicative where we are. Um, for you know somebody in South America, that would actually be the winter range because they're in winter at this at the the time that we're in the summer. Um, but we'll go with breeding and non-breeding. So the red is the breeding range, the blue is the non-breeding range, uh, and that's where the birds are. Uh, for us, you know, essentially winter, they're not here. And that yellow is where you can find them. That's the in-between space where you can find them while they're migrating. Because obviously they can't just go right from blue to red. Um, and so that yellow is that area. And you'll see that on a lot of maps. Here's a nice um, uh, example of what that looks like. Um, specifically drawn off of uh, bird watching data from uh, eBird, and you can see it. You know, obviously, there's there's bare patches in the middle of all that red because there's some places where either people didn't see and record them, or it might not be the right kind of habitat for Baltimore Oriole. Um, this is a, a more traditional map of the the flyways of birds. Um, the piece I want you to to keep in mind for this for later on is birds often use. There are a lot of ways birds can navigate. They can use magnetic cues. They can use uh, sun, the moon, the stars, navigational cues like that. They also can use um, landmarks. They can use geographical points. You know, and if you see, they, they've kind of divided into four main um, groups of flyways. And you've got the blue, which is the Pacific, and the blue, I'm sorry, the green, which is the Pacific, and the blue, which is the Atlantic. Those are the um, two coasts so they can follow the coastline the red is the mississippi it's a big fat river and it's easy to follow and see from the sky and then you've got the central flyway which is the edge of the rockies where the great plains come in and the rockies jut up and there's a real easy um geographical um landmark to see there to follow all the way up plus you've got the wind coming off the plains and it hits those foothills and shoots up and you've got uplift as well you know it always helps when you can have the wind either pushing you up or pushing you at your back there's also altitudinal migration. These are two birds uh, from the west. The uh, the one on the left is the American Dipper. The one on the right is the uh, Stellar's Jay. These are both birds that do uh, that move up and down in the mountains through uh, through the seasons. You know they'll be further up uh, towards the top of the mountains in the summer when it's warmer and you know obviously the the water's not frozen. There's less snow and there's there's more uh, food availability and then move down the mountain or to lower altitudes in the winter when it's cooler and it's not as a good a place to find food up there uh, during that season. And then there's also wet dry uh, migration. Um, the bird on the left, actually both these birds um, migrate in response to the wet and dry seasons in Africa. The one on the right is the Jacobin's cuckoo and this is um, a bird that is thought to really signify the beginning of the, the wet season in India. Um, and so it's a lot, it's got a, a real big, it's got a popular um, persona as far as uh, being the bird that heralds that, that welcomes that. And it, it, I think it's very important in uh, some of those celebrations of the, the wet season. Um, and if you've been in one of my bird programs, sorry, I'm going to read this again. I love this quote. It's from Scott Wiedensong's book, Living on the Wind, which is about migratory birds. Uh, it says, bird migration is the one truly unifying natural phenomenon in the world, stitching the continents together in a way that even the great weather systems, which roar out from the poles, but fizzle at the equator, fail to do. It is an enormously complex subject, perhaps the most compelling drama in all of natural history. He likes birds. You know, and, and that's fair. There's a lot of other migratory animals. What's interesting about this is we know this now. You know, we understand that bird migration is is um, really amazing. It's complex. Again, I did a, an entire hour on just birds last month. Um, you know, birds need stopping points. They do some amazing things to stay uh, aloft for days at, uh, at a time. Uh, they do some amazing things about where they choose and when they choose to cross and, you know, how they can uh, understand the weather and what's going to change. OK, we didn't always know that this is a, a woodcut. Um, I feel like I should say old timey day, but this is a woodcut um, for obviously times past. And what this woodcut is actually showing you, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor or not. Hopefully you can. But in that net, um, the one closest to the bottom is a fish. But the next four that you see with eyes, those are actually all birds. It was thought that some birds like swallows and swifts, which eat insects and hang out near um, aquatic habitats, would dive down into the water and sleep in the mud over the winter. It's not a horrible <laughs> uh, guess. There are worse guesses you could make, but it was at least a... Um, you know, they were at least trying to, to, to make sense to try to understand why you didn't see the birds in the winter. Uh, another really interesting idea, this is a barnacle goose, uh, which incidentally there was one here uh, 
a winter or two ago that hung out in the Anacostia for a while. I think a lot of people went out to try to see. Um, it was thought that the barnacle goose was born from a fruit tree, would drop off the fruit tree the right time of year, and that's why you didn't see them in the winter. Some really strange and interesting ideas of, of how they explained it before we really understood um, about bird migration. And this is a file stork. Uh, it's German for arrow stork. It's got an arrow in it, but it was um, obviously that that spear came from Africa. And that was the f one of the first really connecting thoughts for people where they observed this and were like, OK, this bird didn't just disappear or go to sleep. It went somewhere else, in this case, Africa, and it came back with poor thing with a, a spear in its neck. Um, and this isn't the only one. I, I want to remember there are like 19 different instances where these have been found. Um, so this is, um, but this was, you know, evidence that the birds were going somewhere else during the winter. Um, uh, and this is, I, I threw this picture in here, so I want to remind you here. Again, we're talking about migration. We're talking about seasonal movements. This is a pine siskin. This is one of the birds that can be very uh, eruptive. I-R-R-U-P-T-I-V-E -E is how you would spell that. Um, and this is a bird where, uh, especially like if the seed crop up north isn't very good, you'll get birds like these pine siskins. You'll get birds like uh, red-breasted nuthatches. You'll get birds like uh, crossbills, white-winged and red crossbills that will range further south or west from their typical wintering grounds looking for food because the seed crop where they were, there simply isn't enough and there's, there's either too much competition or just not enough food. Uh, red poles is another one. So they're birds that might move. Um, now I want to talk about, I did promise you we were going to talk about something other than birds. So let's, you know, who else migrates? And there's a lot of animals that move and sometimes it's generational. So I want you to keep that in mind. Um, one that I think hopefully is really familiar to you all around here are critters like the wood frogs and the salamanders. These happen in both of our uh, nature center parks. The uh, Each nature center has a a pond next to it uh and they are both hosts for <clears throat> excuse me uh both of these amphibians which uh the first time at late february uh at least for the wood frogs you get a nice warmer than 50 degree evening and uh wetness you know whether it rain during the day or it rains at night they will move uh they move from where they've been overwintering into the pond uh and begin the process of finding mates and laying eggs uh salamanders do this sometimes a little bit later but salamander, the spotted salamanders would do that well. And they're not the only critters. The further north you go, as the, you have a growing season, a growing season, a uh, breeding season, you know, a summer season that gets more contracted because the further north you go, the later it gets that warm. Uh, and the shorter that growing season, <clears throat> Um, you have other uh, amphibians which might make uh, a bigger impact that as well. You might get ex additional salamander and frog species and toad species that move as well. I feel like it's not always that pronounced down here, although I'm sure you can find places where it is. Um, but these two definitely react to those stimuli and move into the pools. And it's typically the pool where they were born. They often return to the same body of water. Um, there are quite a few insects uh, that are also very good at migrating. This is a, a monarch. I think it's probably, uh, as far as insects go, the most well known uh, and pro probably the well most well documented um, insect species that migrates. And uh, there are quite a few other species that will migrate. We've got some uh, butterflies here. The left column is all butter. The left four are all butterflies, uh, as well as the three more on the bottom. We've got a couple of dragonfly species. The um, Upper right is a large milkweed bug. The middle is the convergent lady beetle. Uh, this is more of a Western species. And then the bottom right is a spotted cucumber beetle. It's important to recognize that in some species of insects, not all the individuals will migrate. There are some where all the individuals do migrate. That's part of it. And there are some where some species, some individuals do migrate and some don't. Um, and so it can be really variable between the different species. <clears throat> um, I thought these, these were some interesting numbers. This is an article I read, uh, and they were talking about surveying um, and trying to get an idea of how many insects were essentially in the air column above the uh, southern United Kingdom. And this is a report that was came out in 2016, uh, and they estimated um, that there were about 3.5 trillion insects that migrate above the the southern uk every year every year okay that's um you know compare that to 2.1 billion songbirds that is a tremendous tremendous number of um insects that are 
uh, up there in in the sky over that period of time. That translates, or that es you know, they estimated from that number that it's about thirty two hundred tons of biomass. To put that, because a ton is really neat, but a ton is like two thousand pounds. Okay, that's really really a lot. So if you want to make that number bigger, you multiply that by two thousand. Um, and I think my math is right. That's like six point four million pounds of insect biomass. Uh, and my favorite thing is to try to compare everything to a bag of five pound bag of flour because I know what that weighs, you know, and I'm used to to holding that. And <laughs> um, that's like, I, well, I did this in my hand. That's like 1.3 million bags of five pound bags of flour floating up there in the sky over the course of a year. That is a ton, literally tons and tons of insects. It's absolutely amazing. This is a major you can see the next bolt there. This is a, a is a major factor in the redistributing of energy and nutrients between geographic regions, because if they're eating one place and going somewhere else and 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 pooping and reproducing and dying, they are trans you know transferring uh, nutrients. That's the carbon cycle. That's the phosphorus cycle. That's the um, it's the water cycle. You know, all those different cycles are being influenced by this massive movement of insects. And this is not the whole planet this is one spot this is the southern um uh island you know of the united kingdom it's not even a whole island you know they're not even talking about europe they're just talking about that island uh, it's really really these numbers are really really incredible especially if you extrapolate that globally you can see that this represents uh, possibly the most important animal movement in terrestrial ecosystems we're going to talk about also one of the most important animal movements in aquatic ecosystems later on but this is a tremendous amount of, 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 for lack of a better way of putting it, stuff being moved around, nutrients and energy that's going from one place to another, all in the forms of these little insects. I hit something that, there we go. Um, so back to the monarch. The monarch is probably the most famous uh, migratory insect. Um, and I think everybody, you know, most people I think gets this in first grade. Everybody recognizes You've got your egg and you got your caterpillar and you got your pupa. Sorry, your egg, your larva, which is a caterpillar, your pupa, this is the chrysalis, and you've got the, your adult butterfly. You know, this is that four step process that is um, the life cycle of a butterfly. OK, for monarchs, their migration is generational. Um, and I'm going to apologize now. It's always bad for me to do that, but I'm going to apologize now because I might not get this entirely accurate and correct. Every time I read it, I feel like I'm reading something different and I struggle with a little bit of it. But I think the, the, the piece that's so important about monarchs isn't just that it's generational, but that there is one of those generations where the individuals head south and then actually start the journey back north. Uh, and the rest are all just one directional, uh, but most other species it's generational and each of those generations just goes one direction and that's it. And that's one of the things that's unique about the monarch is that at least one of their generations actually does the turnaround and goes in one direction and turns around and starts the other direction. Um, but what happens is you'll have, I'm hoping I remember this correctly, you have three generations it takes to get up north. That's why they all slid in from the, the bottom. And then that last generation is the one that heads back south and also does the turnaround and starts the northward migration for the next generation. And the other thing that's really amazing about this is these monarchs aren't teaching their youngsters where to go. There's no opportunity for the next generation of monarchs to learn from the previous generation. Um, so there is, my assumption is some kind of instinct or something that's hardwired in. Uh, where they're able to to do this and figure that out. And then you also think about butterflies. You know, you're not talking about the the strongest flying insect out there, and they're going a tremendous distance. Uh, even just as the individuals, even not even if you don't take into the account the entire, um, if you don't take into account the entire cycle, uh, they're still traveling quite a distance uh, as small fluttering butterflies. Uh, and there are several butterfly species that do uh, migrate as well. Um, I, I think I can remember most of these in the upper left. This is a question mark uh, on the bottom left. This is the uh, red admiral. Uh, the next one on the top uh, is the buckeye. The yellow one on the pink, pink flower is one of the sulfurs. Um, the ones below it and to the left, one is a painted lady and one is a American, an American lady. And I'm realizing now as I'm looking at them, I don't remember 
which one is which, but they're both ladies and one's American, one's painted. Uh, you got one of the skippers in the middle and then you got the fiery skipper uh, in the bottom right. And these are all examples of uh, butterflies that are migratory. There's actually 27 species of butterflies that are migratory in North America. Um, and there's many more species that are migratory uh, in other regions around the world. Um, dragonflies are another um, migratory insect, okay? Uh, and they will do a lot of the same things that birds do. They're waiting for that wind to beat their back to help them go. They're waiting for the time to be just right, um, you know, for them to migrate and make sure that they can take advantage of <clears throat> what they need to do. One of the things that's neat about it, this is a common green darner. It's a really good example of a migratory dragonfly. I'm going to show you a better one in a couple minutes. Um, if you'll look, if you'll notice the 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 classic, I'm going to skip ahead and come back. This is typically what you see. Common green darner's got a green abdomen and uh, uh, sorry, green thorax, and the head can be greenish, but the abdomen is this uh, light blue. It's really pretty color, and so you got this nice combination of green and light blue. Uh, but you might be saying to yourself, Ken, that dragonfly has a dark purple. Uh, abdomen and it does and this is uh, one of its um, physiological uh, adaptations uh, to help it migrate better in the fall <clears throat> if you if you walked out this morning you know it's a little bit colder than it was last week and I think we all really felt that chill this morning um, for a dragonfly that needs high temperatures and is at the whim of of the weather uh, a morning like this could be really difficult uh, and a day like this could have been actually possibly really impossible or very difficult for these dragonflies to move. I always tell people that when I go out and look for dragonflies, I want it to be hot. I want it to be a nice hot day. Yeah, I'm going to sweat like a pig and I'm going to need to change my shirt as soon as I get out of the sun because uh, it's going to be all sweaty. But that's a good day for the dragonflies because they need that heat in order to be active. Um, so it's great, maybe the greatest for like photographing them, but it's greatest for seeing them. Um, on a cool morning where you're not going to get that heat, having um, your body be able to, to change color, to be able to concentrate, um, I think it's pigments in the in the abdomen to make you darker is going to help you warm up quicker. And again, they need that warmth in order to beat their wings as fast as they need to to fly. So being able to change the color of your abdomen is really, really important for helping you get going in the morning. And so this is one of those uh, adaptations that's really important to help that dragonfly um, migrate. Um, common green darners will migrate south from here. Uh, and when they get south, they will uh, lay egg, you know, mate, lay eggs and die. Uh, and that next generation will uh, develop from the eggs, they'll hatch, they develop as uh, nymphs underneath the water, do everything they need to do to get bigger and emerge out of the water as adults, and they will migrate north, uh, mate and lay eggs and die, and then that process repeats. So they are migratory, but it is a generational migrant. It's a generational migration. Um, we're not just like the, mo the monitors. We're not getting the same individuals that return as we had uh, um, as left. Um, it's there. It's, it's a one way um, migration for the individuals, but for the population, they they do come back and it is cyclical. Um, and this is the um, the nymph underwater. This is a, a pretty good size one. Uh, his wing budget is still a small, so there's probably another molt. Um, as a nymph before it would molt into an adult, uh, but here you can see. Um, uh, a male common green darner uh, is mate guarding the female. He's he's class or behind the uh, head. They are they're done mating. Um, because they would be in a full wheel posture. Um, her abdomen would be around to uh, the underside of the male if they were actually mating. Right now, he's just mate guarding her, trying to prevent her from mating with other individuals while she lays her eggs. And that's why her abdomen is uh, submerged into the water there. One really interesting fact that I, I stumbled across the, when I did this program is that um, kestrels often migrate in the, the same area in the same distances in the same way uh, times as the uh, the dragonflies and they will utilize those dragonflies as food as a food source during the migration uh, on a day where um you know the, the conditions are right the weather you got the wind at your back you got the right kind of temperature not a lot of um, preying on the dragonflies happens because the kestrels also just like the dragonflies try to maximize 
those good conditions and get as far as it can as part of its migration. But on a day where the conditions might not be as, as good, they'll spend a little more time hunting and, and feeding on the, the dragonflies again as they uh, migrate. Um, uh, in the article I, I read about this, uh, there was somebody who documented all the dragonflies they were seeing on um, whatever ridge they were doing a hawk watch at in the fall to see the migrating raptors. Uh, and I think they recorded um, 2,000 kestrels and 10,000 dragonflies, you know, a tremendous number of dragonflies. And that's a number of dragonflies that some of them, yes, will become prey for the kestrels, but more than enough of them will make it to their final destination so that they can keep that cycle going. Um, but it was a really neat uh, thing to read that not only is the the kestrel um, utilizing them as a food source, but both the dragonflies and these predatory birds were used following pretty much the same cues to decide when to migrate um, and, and using the same type of um, air conditions to help them get where they needed to go. Uh, and they were also there's also some interesting articles that you can check out about um, they would put they were putting trackers on some of these. This is not a common green darner. This looks more like a swamp darner. Um, but they were putting these little tracking pieces on the dragonflies and trying to figure out how far they would go. You know, and again, if you you know you think about it, like these old stories and some of these crazy stories about where people thought um, these animals went during the winter, they just didn't know. You know, we've got the technology now where we can do this. I mean, even when I was a kid, I don't know how small they could get some of these transmitters. Now they can get them ridiculously small. Um, and so being able to to get this kind of information uh, and again, then also having satellites or other kinds of um, technology that are able to receive the signal so you can constantly track them is just is just fabulous. And it gives us a wealth of new knowledge and understanding about what's happening to these critters uh, when they leave, you know, where they're going, how long are they traveling, what distances and all that. And, it, and this is, you know, um, that little bit of science that makes that really important for us. Uh, and there are several species of, of dragonflies that are migratory as well. Here's another swamp darner. Uh, I want to point out this one here. This is a black saddlebags. Notice the black near the base of the abdomen. It's also thought that this coloration um, acts similarly to like that purple coloring of the abdomen on the common green darner, where it helps them uh, warm up their flight muscles because the dark is so close to the base of the wings, and that can help them warm their flight muscles up quicker on those days. You can see also here, like this is a, green, a blue dasher. You can see it's a little dark next to the um, where the uh, flight muscles are as well. Um, most insects have their flight muscles uh, just attached to, they have muscles attached to the inside of the exoskeleton. They act on the exoskeleton, and that moves the wings, where in dragonflies, their flight muscles are attached directly to the base of their wings so they can control their all four wings independently um but they also have more more control with how they move their uh wings which helps them obviously be um an incredible uh maneuvering uh insect helps them with incredible maneuverability while they're up in the air um oh yeah and then this guy oh no it's not in here this one right here is the wandering glider which is uh which is called around here it's also called the globe skimmer uh its scientific name is right there and i'm not going to try to pronounce it because i don't know how good my latin is um this is a, a dragonfly you'll definitely find around here they don't perch often uh, i think i might have a picture on iNaturalist, but i'm not sure if it was one that died or if it was one that just happened to stop but typically if you see something called a glider like that they they really they rarely stop they're constantly on the move and, and up in the air column this is the range of the wandering glider, and I think globe skimmer probably really is a good name if you look at that. It's got a, a fairly cosmopolitan distribution. You can certainly see it's on just about every continent except Antarctica, uh, Asia, Europe, uh, Africa, Australia. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, six out of seven. Um, and what's really neat is, um, the, you know, here's an example of one of their migrations. Uh, this is the, uh, you know, the edge of Africa here, just to make sure because it's all black and white. Uh, this is the edge of Africa here on the left. You've got Madagascar down there above the actual uh, where the text, where the actual name of the, the dragonfly is, the scientific name. You can see that's the upper half of Madagascar and over on the right with the where the dragonfly is with the red number one. That is India. You know, so this is showing the migratory route of this dragonfly between Africa and India. It's flying over the ocean. 
And I don't know if they're finding any food there or not. I really can't speak to that. But this is an insect that migrates over the open. I believe uh, you can see in the last bullet, it's the only insect to do so uh, when they cross the Arabian Sea. Um, it's the highest flying dragonfly. They've been recorded at 6,200 meters in the Himalayas. Again, I always like to put it to numbers that I can understand. A meter is roughly three feet, so that's like 18,600 feet high. That is really high, and it's got to be cool. So how they're, um, you know, what that adaptation is, I don't know, and I'm very curious about that, about that to be fly that high and not freeze or die because it's so cool that they can't maintain their flight. They were the first uh, to repopulate the Bikini Atoll after the uh, atomic tests, and it's the only odonate that's found on Easter Island. Uh, they have a global panmictic population, and this is really cool. Panmixis means that you are your mating within your population is random. You know, so it's one of those deals where like, hey, you're a, uh, you know, you're a wandering glider too. Cool. Let's uh eggs apparently they're not very picky or maybe that's just something we don't understand but uh i've definitely read this multiple places where there it says they are global pan mictic pan population which is essentially random mating um so i don't know how unless that's like a constant rejumbling rejumbling of the uh, genetic pool or the genetic sequence and that's why it it, it it benefits them you know but typically with most critters there are some kinds of cues for why they do or don't uh, why they do select certain mates. Uh, their migration is multi-generational, and it's 11,200-mile migration, uh, one of the longest insect migrations, and that includes that individual stretch of 3,730 miles um, by one individual. I don't even want to think about, you know, I, 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 I got big numbers in my car odometer, but I can't even fathom traveling 3,730 miles uh, without some kind of mechanism, you know, just walking that was just, it's just insane. Maybe on a boat, but even then my arms are going to get tired. It's just amazing numbers for these really, really small individuals. So let's take a dip. <clears throat> I want to talk about the American eel for a minute because they're a fascinating little uh, migratory fish. Another one that you can find right here in Arlington. If you don't know, for uh, one really good example of how interesting these fish are. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the only fish currently found in Gulf Branch. Um, the way Gulf Branch is is shaped, uh, it rains. The water rushes through there like a freight train, washes everything out into the Potomac. I actually had somebody once ask me, like, "What happens to all the fish? I keep dumping fish in your stream, so just some fish, and they keep disappearing." And I said, "Well, if nobody's eating them, they're still getting flushed out by you know rainstorm. And also, I don't know what fish you're sticking in our stream, but please stop." Um, but these guys are able to hide among the rocks and in the cracks and crevices and crannies um, so that they're not they don't get washed out. They're also the only fish probably in the Potomac that's able to come up the waterfall at the end of our stream um, and able to essentially to get up that palisade and, and back into the stream. And so we have them. They're fairly common in the um, in the stream. You can see them in the drop pool on the other side of a uh, military road. Uh, the downstream side of Military Road, that big pool. Um, you know, if you got a good flashlight, you can usually catch them after dark. You can see a few moving around in there, depending on the clarity of the water. Um, this is where this is their native freshwater range. The the thing to remember here is they're coming from essentially where you know, like native and freshwater are. That's the kind of the area where the Sargasso Sea is. That's where they start. And they're journeying all the way across that open water to the coastline. So anywhere you see them in gray got there from the coast so like you know when you're, you're looking at minnesota and with eels that came all the way up say the Minis the mississippi and then some side stream to wherever you're finding them so these aren't guys you're just going to find typically on unless that lake or pond is connected to a stream that's connected to a river that's connected to a bay and the ocean um, but they need that connection from the ocean in order to get there but you can see they utilize you know, most of the, the eastern U.S., uh, all along the Gulf of Mexico, the shoreline, you know, all kinds of different places they're going in here. Um, <clears throat> they are catadromous. They This is a migratory behavior where the fish spend their lives in freshwater, but they travel to the sea. And, 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 and you know, this is the, def, the definition from the dictionary zoology. <clears throat> Excuse me. They start in the uh, ocean and they traveled out to freshwater. They'll spend 10 to 25 years 
in Gulf Branch or whatever stream they're in, and then they will head back out when it's time to mate. They have a type of mating that's called Stemmel Paris, I believe it is what it's called, and it's big bag mating. They mate and they die, so that's it, one mating. So they spend whether it's you know a decade here or you know a quarter of a century, uh, and they head back for that one big mating. I don't know that anybody. Uh, any human eyes have you know recorded or laid eyes on this mating? You know, it happens out there in the ocean. Um, but that's it. One mating and then they're done. Uh, but the next generation comes here. So you can also see how while the individual makes that entire cycle, they only do it once. So it is also kind of a generation, it's a generational migration as well. Uh, the opposite of that is anadromous. We think of that with you know with uh, salmon and and some of the other fish that uh, spend their lives in the ocean. Uh, but they migrate to fresh water to spawn. Uh, also true for lampreys, which are really, really odd looking fish, but that's also worth a, a Google and a little reading to, to understand how those uh, those fish live. Um, here is a, a nice graphic that shows the uh, where these fish are or where the eels are throughout their life. The eggs are laid in the ocean. Um, the leptocephalus looks like a glass eel. It's it's transparent. They can't really swim against the current, so they Follow the currents, uh, which gently guide them, or not gently, uh, but end up taking them all along the coast of, of the continent of uh, North America and you see also as well as Central America and some South America. Um, and up here, they um, slowly begin to change. They go from glass eel to elver, and they begin to change from being almost transparent see through to very dark, so it's hard to see them on them. Um, and their bodies go through change. Each of these arrows, as they go from each of these stages, is indicating a time of there's a there's a distinct change between what that um the physiological uh parts of that eel the eel has different adaptations for each of these these stages if i remember correctly what we see is the yellow eel because once they get to the silver eel that heads out to spawning there's a lot of things that change in, in that eel's body as well because its body is getting ready for essentially a, a, a tremendous um migration back to the spawning grounds and you might think it's not too hard to swim downstream um but just even a yield just from gulf branch has to get down gulf branch get down those falls get into the potomac then it has to go out the potomac and then go out to chesapeake bay into the atlantic ocean navigate across the ocean to the sargasso sea to then spawn uh they'll die and then their youngsters that hatch from that spawning will come back and repeat that whole process at the same time that all that's happening you have European eels coming from Europe across the ocean to the Sargasso Sea to lay to spawn and lay their eggs the same way, and somehow the two don't mix. Now their their um, uh, chromosome number is different, so they can't they couldn't physically reproduce if they wanted to, um, but all that is happening at the Sargasso Sea, uh, and so it just it's a tremendous journey for these critters. Um, yeah, you know, here's another nice. Um, image that shows they can make it all the way up to Greenland, but you know they're fun. And, and again, here's the Sargasso Sea. The spawning location is really unknown. We, we It's never really been witnessed. That would be uh, pretty amazing if somebody was able to find that. I also think that would be kind of a bummer because it would be it would possibly lead to their exploitation as well because eels are a, a popular food and I'd hate to see that area be get, get uh, exploited by that for the eels, although um, you could argue that the, the youngsters at least aren't going to be good eating and hopefully um, nobody can figure out to get there to disturb the adults before they do what they need to do. Uh, so those are the American eels. <clears throat> Humpback whales are another migratory species, which is really, really wild. And again, this is one we don't have around here, but I thought it was kind of neat to talk about how that these large whales are out there in the ocean and they also migrate. Um, this one's here, interesting, right here in the kind of in the middle here. If you can see this um, text box, it's got a corner on South America and a corner in Africa. There was they tracked uh, several of these humpbacks um, that this uh, article came from, where I got this graphic, and they tracked this one female humpback who left from Brazil and traveled all around the tip of Africa to Madagascar, which was a migration of six thousand eighty-nine miles. Um, 
and over here, and then just to the left that the longest consistent migration recorded is about 5,160 miles between Costa Rica and Antarctica. Uh, I think the average is closer to 3,000, but the, the whales migrate between breeding and non -breed, and breeding and feeding grounds. Essentially, they breed and they go somewhere to feed. So you can see there's, um, you know, there's these fish that are indicating the feeding grounds. There's the whales that indicate the breeding ground. And you can see See, there's different um, pathways here, and it's not quite as defined or as narrow as some of the the, the bird migration, um, because the obviously they can't fly, um, and so they have uh, these more narrow paths. But these um, humpback whales are uh, learning this. That the, the advantage that the whales have is they're able to learn this from their adults, and so that's uh, you know a big difference between these and, and, and like insects, which may not have any kind of don't probably don't have any kind of learning from the generation before them at all. Um, and I, uh, one thing that's really, really interesting is um, humpbacks. Let me come back to that. Uh, humpbacks, it's not entirely, we're not entirely sure as far as I understand how they know which way to go when they migrate because they can look at the sun or the moon, really, if you want. Uh, and there's there's the chance that they can uh, sense some uh, magnetic waves. They can sense the magnetic um field of the earth but that's only going to get you so far and the difference between magnetic north and real north can sometimes change if you've ever used a, a compass to orient all these lines uh you can see the needle in the compass housing uh and there's the main arrow through the middle and then on the, each side there's these lines these are called declination lines and if you're really hardcore in or orienteering one of the things you have to figure out from where you're at is what's the declination for your area meaning what's the difference between true magno true north and magnetic north i don't know how to do that but i know that some people do that um what is what is interesting about that is the problem for a whale especially if you're traveling three thousand miles and whoops, let's come back here. Going, you know, several thousand miles, that the declination of one area could be very different from the other. Um, if you have a chance, there's some really neat um, videos on YouTube that show how the declination has changed in North America over the last two to three hundred years. You know, really neat animation that shows it moving, and it shows why, you know, depending on where you are, the declination can be high or low, but it could be really, it could seriously impact your orienteering. Uh, you know, and how you figure out where you're going. And the same would be true for for whales. So it's actually thought that they might use a combination of the two where they do have some sensing for the magnetic um, field. And they also, you know, are, are just using things like the sun and the moon to navigate. This is a whale that's sky hopping. Uh, this essentially sticking your head up above the water and taking a peek. Uh, and whales, uh, killer whales do this, and there's probably a few other critters that do this as well. Um, but this is one way to kind of get up to the surface and take a look around uh, and see where you're at. Um, when they track the whales I mentioned earlier, how you know, however many they did, I, I feel like it was 16, they found that it didn't seem like the whales were responding to just solar cues or just magnetic cues, and that there was a combination of the two that was... Uh, that was probably what they were doing because they didn't get fooled when the sun was in a different position. They didn't get fooled when the, the declination was off as well. So just keeping an eye on you. <laughs> uh, and then I, the last uh, migration I really want to talk about is this idea of dial uh, vertical migration. And what's happening here is small and large critters are moving uh, in the water column either close to the surface or away from the surface where it's darker uh, as a as a response to the, the daylight. Um, and this is a pretty big deal. Fish can do it. Uh, squid can do it. Um, cr crustaceans, small crustaceans. I'm thinking like plankton, like copepods. These are Daphne, all these little ones here. You see they move down deep during the day to avoid predation by fish. They can also avoid you know getting damaged by the UV of the sun. Uh, and then they move up at night to take advantage of it being much harder for these fish to find them. A lot of these fish might be sight predators, and so they're able to cue on the Daphnia uh, in the daylight, but at night when it's harder to see them, the Daphnia can move up in the water column. They might also be taking advantage of food, such as phytoplankton, which you don't find much lower in the water, where it's, it doesn't get as much sunlight down there, and so it's not as um, uh, efficient to photosynthesize, but they're able to, those, um, phytoplankton that are up here photosynthesizing during the day uh, aren't moving. And so when these 
zooplankton move, they're able to feed on that phytoplankton. And then, of course, their predators are going to follow them as well. And so what you end up with is something that looks like this. Uh, the idea of this animation here, you can see the light. Uh, and this is showing you how the different, um, how the uh, critters are moving in the water column in response to the light. As the, the, the earth turns and the sun goes down, you can see the all these critters here, this white band. This is phytoplankton, or this is zooplankton. And you can see there's also some fish and other um animals moving in there they're to move through um phytoplankton plankton are organisms that can't very effectively fight the current so they're kind of they get moved by currents but they can move somewhat through the water columns you see here nectin are animals that can swim on their own power like fish and so you can see that both plankton and some nectin are moving through the water column here um i just i, I love this it's very it's also very calming to watch, but I really like this um, animation because it shows how, you know, here's the sun and they're really down low out of that out of that sunlight. And as soon as the sun moves, they've moved up closer to the surface uh, to take advantage of their not being a sun and also to get that food source. So I mentioned I mentioned some of these already, uh, but some of the advantages of this movement is that you can avoid predators. It's harder to see you when you're in the dark. Um, so staying low in dark areas is is really advantageous. Going up into the the upper levels of the water when it's dark above and there's not sun coming through, it helps you graze on phytoplankton. Uh, so there's metabolic advantages to getting that food. Um, they can uh, disperse and transport. And, and again, like I said, avoid ultraviolet damage. There's also evidence that shows that like fish that might do this kind of movement as well. If you're a big fish, you might move sooner. If you're a small fish, you might wait longer. So a small fish that's still um, uh, liable to get predated on by larger fish might not move as quickly up through that water column until it's much darker, whereas a larger fish that has less predators to worry about might move through that water column sooner. And so um, it all depends on your size. Uh, and then I, I want to do also make a, a real quick comment on, you know, there's so many other migrations out there that are really, really amazing. This is the, um, oh, I think it's the Christmas Island red crab. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, but these crabs, which are inland on the island, move to the water to spawn and they and they do this annually and it's this tremendous uh migration and i mean there's so many of them that they stop cars um there is an introduced ant species that is wreaking havoc on their population which is unfortunate um and i think it's maybe dropped their numbers by a quarter or a third but not uh, it hasn't gone beyond that then but you know it's in, it's in and it's an accidental introduction it's not like they're like this ant species would be great for the ecosystem uh it was a complete mistake but um it has definitely been a problem for these crabs but they're still out there um in really large numbers millions um that will move to spawn every year uh and it's a pretty incredible um uh, occurrence it happens on christmas island and it happens on i think the cocos islands is the other name uh and these are islands that are west of uh indonesia um south of asia and west of indonesia in the uh indian ocean there um this is not the the best image i think i, I pulled this off of pinterest but i wanted to throw this out there this is a really neat poster from a national geographic called great migrations and it doesn't just show um birds but it shows lots of other cool critters as well and if you can ever get uh the chance to look at that i highly recommend it there's a lot of amazing um migratory species out there you know here's a christmas island crab down just to the right of the the sea turtle above the sea turtle and the frog there's the monarch and the green uh and a dragonfly you know we talked about some of those if you look in the middle of the bottom that's the uh that's a european eel i think it's not the american eel but it's a very similar story sharks migrate if you look over to the right there's a tuna as well whales uh and there's some large mammals that do as well and of course bats anyway i didn't even talk about bats so there's a lot of really neat migration stories out there and, and encourage you to find them and uh who knows maybe i'll do this program again in a year or so and i'll try to not talk about any of the critters i did just do a whole bunch of different ones um but that is where i'm at for the day um and this one's just encouraging you to get out of your bed because if the other critters do it you can too um and i always encourage people to check out uh, birdandmoon.com they have a lot of really cute and really neat um uh 
cartoons and comic strips, but they also have some really good educational stuff as well. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Whoops, that's not how I do it. Um, that's going to end my program. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if anybody has uh, any questions. And I'll check the chat. If anybody has any questions, now would be the time to hit me with them. Nobody? I did that good a job? Come on, somebody's got to have a question. Okay. Well, very good. Thank you all for joining me this evening. Um, trying off the top of my head, I'm going to pull it up on my calendar to remember what next month's deep dive will be. Um, was it November 16th? 16th, it is. Oh, I'm going to do hibernation. Uh, here I did two different kinds of migration. Let's do some uh, hibernation and uh, really hit that. And we'll talk about which critters actually do hibernate, which don't, and throw up a whole bunch of different terms at you of different kinds of um sleeping throughout the the winter season because there are different terms and uh, make sure you got the right one so that uh when people start talking about you can be like actually that's not hibernation um but thank you for joining me this evening appreciate your time uh, i hope you had a good one and i will um give you about 10 seconds to get out of here on your own <laughs> and i'm just going to go ahead and end the meeting but i appreciate y'all being here thank you so much thank, thank you very you. much Bye -bye. thank you thank you're you you're welcome bye bye, -bye.